Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a training on library services for incarcerated people in the LIS classroom. This training is part of San Francisco Public Library's Jail and Reentry Services Department's Expanding Information Access for Incarcerated People grant work, which is made possible with funding from the Mellon Foundation. This training will be posted and publicly available on the YouTube channel for Jail and Reentry Services at SFPL, and will also be available through the American Library Association's Learning Management System. If you'd like to receive a certificate for participating in this training, please sign in through the ALA Learning Management System and view the training there. You can receive a certificate for free for viewing this training. Today, we'll hear from a number of speakers who are incorporating information about library services for incarcerated people into their library and information science classrooms. But first, we'll begin by hearing from Darius Coleman about his own lived experience. Hello, my name is Darius, and I am a formerly incarcerated adult who has been in and out of the criminal justice system and I struggle with homelessness and addiction since the age of 15. The reason why I bring up my struggles is because I have spent decades of my life trying to escape my reality. The year 2017 started with me continuing the cycle of incarceration I had created for myself. While I was inside the jail, I would continue to find ways to escape my harsh reality by reading books to occupy my time any book I could get my hands on. The bigger the fantasy, the less I saw my reality. The public library jail and reentry services would come into each living unit of the jail with a cart of books. I remember first thinking, look at all those new books. The librarians would ask me about some of my challenges I faced and would print out resources to assist me reentering society. When the public library reentry service entered the living unit. They introduced me to a variety of books that brought me into reality, such as self-help books, books of people who had similar struggles and obstacles and faced throughout, I faced throughout my life and how they overcame them. And most importantly, books on how to build a business from the ground up. Um, the reason why that is so important to me is because Upon my release January 2020, and with the resources combined with the self-help books, I developed a new mindset that gave me a new perspective on life. I was able to get into a treatment program, gain full-time employment, start a small business, and publish a book that give people with the same struggles I face hope, and I owe a big part to the public library reentry services for helping me put together my foundation. Thank you. Darius, thank you so much for sharing that information with us and with all of our viewers. And, you know, we're really, as librarians, proud to be part of your journey. Um, we know, too, that your story is not, is, it's unique to you, but it's also just a statement of the profound value of libraries inside and the importance of doing this work. And we also hear through work that we do with LAS students and interns, that there's a lot of interest in doing this work, even though there aren't a lot of programs like ours. And so I think part of the value of this training is really that it'll help support other uh, instructors in library and information science to bring this topic into their own classrooms, because we know there is interest from students. And we know, as your testimony gives, that there is a real need for more library services inside. Just thank you. Hello, my name is Shanta Smith Cruz. I go by Sean. Thank you for tuning in. I want to introduce you to a project called the Reference Letters to Incarcerated Peoples Project. It is a course integrated project with the Pratt School of Library Information Science, or rather, the Pratt School of Information. I'm an adjunct assistant professor at the Pratt School of Information, and I teach the course 652 Reference and Instruction. Um, I've been doing it for about five years or 11 courses now. 
Um, I'm also an associate dean for teaching, learning, and engagement at New York University Division of Library. So I'm excited to share the work with you. I'm going to turn my camera off as we go in, but let's get started. What we're going to cover today is first an overview of the reference letters to incarcerated peoples project. I'm going to discuss um, sort of the critical analysis and critical pedagogy that's interwoven into the class, go over the course's components, and also provide some testimonials or student feedback. Um, and then just end with considerations for what you should think about if you wanna integrate this into your class. So first, what is the Reference Letters to Incarcerated Peoples project or program? I go back and forth. Uh, this is, it's a course integrated experience. It's run through the New York Public Libraries, Jail and Prison Services Division, where people who are incarcerated send letters to the public library. And then the library hosts a series of volunteers to answer those questions um, in addition to the staff, the very small staff that they have. The collaborative relationship allows for the students who are receiving their MLIS to integrate real-time reference work into their learning. The collaboration is beneficial for the New York Public Library staff to receive support from volunteer help, but it's structured volunteer help. On average, every month, the New York Public Library's jail and prison services departments receive over 90 letters from incarcerated people from across the country who are requesting reference service. Volunteers go through a series of training in order to answer the letters in a uniform way. And it is the collaboration with the Library Science Program at the Pratt School of Information that really allows for this to become a sustainable model at scale. Many volunteers who continue to staff the Public Library Service have come via the Pratt collaboration. But what do I mean when I say by scale? So because the reference and instruction course is a core course at the library school, every student runs through this class. Um, and it's also one that everyone who graduates gets to say they participated in. So if we look at these uh, numbers at the screen, each student provides or answers three letters um, per semester. A section has about, at most, 18 students. I think my smallest section had eight. So you have eight to 18 students per class, per session. And there's always about two sections of the course. And so with that in mind, we're answering 48 to 108 letters a year. Um, and I think a few semesters we've had three courses. So it can even add another 48 numbers to that. So that means that we get to have 200 to 250 letters a year answered as a result of this program through the Pratt School of Information. The letters are being answered not only by the student, but they're being vetted by myself as the professor. And each of these students has the opportunity to meet with the New York Public Library staff person to think through how they might answer these questions in a uniform way. So I want to jump back and talk a little bit about how it is possible to incorporate that work into the class. The type of work uh, does take some energy to coordinate um, and it has to be considered if you really want to think about this as sustainable and how it might integrate into the larger course. As a result of that, the Reference Services to Incarcerated Peoples project takes up 35% of the grade for the course. It is alongside this work that I also provide uh, the students also undertake a group project for um, where they create a libguide or a web resource. That's 30%. They have to do a demonstration in front of class and their lesson plan, that's 20%. They create a personal statement, that's 5%. And then their class participation <clears throat> is 10%. And it's sort of a catch-all. Everybody participates. But now I wanna to jump to how sort of it applies, not just in a structural way, but critically, like how can we not only provide a service, a real-time service, but also how do we contextualize this work for students as they embark on their MLIS journey? 
When considering criticality and how it's applied for this course, the critical concepts are interwoven throughout the semester's readings. It's one of the, it's a sort of very focused um, component of the class from day one. I apply the Association for College and Research Libraries frameworks or the ACRL frameworks um, as functions for integrative learning, um, meaning that we think through how each of the frames is applied to reference service and to instruction. Alongside ACRL, I also foreground political perspectives into the curriculum. And so most of this comes from the readings, but also in our conversations, in our group work, in how they provide their demos, the communities that they think about, as well as the topical lib guides that they create along with their groups. The political perspectives that I, that I make sure to incorporate are anti-racist, or rather um, perspectives that incorporate anti-racism, not only from within LIS, but also across ethnic studies. So we're bringing in uh, authors from across fields. Centre Pensante, which is uh, sensing thinking pedagogy, and it aims to incorporate a worldview thinking, one that is not centering Western concepts, but centers concepts from communities across various global landscapes. Feminist practice, praxis or considerations of how gender um, is relative to reference services, especially at the desk, for example. Neutrality uh, comes up where we think about whiteness and structural racism and how neutrality is complicit with this. And all of the topical uh, fund sort of foregrounding political perspectives are grounded in critical race theory. And we use the core tenets of critical race theory and think about how it shows up in libraries. And then of course, how race shows up in this project. I wanted to make sure that you know that you can look to the syllabus to see which readings have been used. The Pratt Syllabus Archive is available online, openly accessible. You just have to search on Google Pratt Syllabus Archive. And here it is. You can go into this Google Drive folder and the, archive, the syllabi from 2011 all the way to 2023 are posted in the Google Drive folder. So if we went to say spring of 2022, you could see the syllabus for every class. And so my this course is 652, and there I go, 652 Smith Cruz. Uh, I taught two sections in that spring, so you have two, two sections to look at, but there was also another uh, section taught by another professor. So you could see how we've differed our approach to this program within our syllabus, which I'm not gonna click on, but you can do so um, on your own. I also wanted to talk about <clears throat> the structure of the course. Um, I think it's important to note that the course itself is extremely, um, it does require some, the, the project requires some structure um, in order to align it with the course. Actually, I am gonna go in here. I'm sorry that I jumped around, but I'm gonna scroll down past the course goals to this assignments at a glance. So you can see how we organize not only the course, um, the assignments, but then also what the students have to do and what they have to deliver and how the dates are organized. And so you see that each letter is actually 18 pages long. Um, and that means that they have to deliver it timely, but also deliver it comprehensively. Afterwards, they have a final report for which they have to discuss their experience writing the letter. I also wanted to show what a typical day would look like. And so in the, cl in the class itself or at the start of the class, um, we bring in readings by say Jennifer Ferretti on neutrality or Fabazi Etar on um, intersectionality. But each class also has an active learning strategy. And we start with um, critical librarianship, neutrality and intersectionality to then get to a second class where 
Emily Jacobson, who is the representative of the New York Public Library Prison Services, Jail and Prison Services um, Department, comes and talks about the program. And she actually goes through the, the various um, components of the work. Before students uh, meet with Emily, they're asked to read her article, um, which is a chapter that references this actual program. And it's in the text, uh, Reference Librarianship and Justice, that's um, edited by uh, Liam Madler, um, Ian Bellin, and Eamon Toole. And that's actually a core reading for the class. The last thing I'll say is that the students are assigned letters every class. Um, the first one for this quote class, they got five letters. The next one they got four. And so every class we provide letters to the students to choose from. All right, now I'm gonna go back into the structure because I think once she saw that, um, this will make more sense. Mm -hmm. It is very important that second class that the student introductory session allows for the student to uh, have questions ready for the public librarian um, who is going to uh, sort of overview this, this service, but also talk about what it means to be a librarian who provides a work in or against prisons. Um, so, so that is a really formative moment for students to really get to the, the basis of what um, what this work is and how it impacts on a broad scale. Uh, we also have them read the book chapters so that they're able to articulate what questions came up for them. We talk about what the rules are in reference to the letters and how they, you know, what the rules are for the program itself. What are the restrictions that prisons pose upon the receipt of these letters? Um, and we also read through every letter together out loud. And I actually do that in every class that they're assigned. We scaffold throughout the semester. So that means if there are uh, 18 students and three letters per student, I have to have enough letters per class to allow for the last distribution of letters to give time for students to then write their final paper. One thing that's interesting is we never share a sample of an answered letter. So students are only hearing about the rules and the process from our conversations. And that's because we don't want them to think about a structure that they have to fit into or a template they have to fit into. Instead, we say, here's how you, you know, sort of post a letter like dear blank and then sign blank. Everything in between is up to you to make that concerted decision about how you want to lay out the design of this letter onto the page so that it's readable in print by someone who may, for example, not have access, not be able to um, have a letter stapled because staples wouldn't be possible so that it, it would be something that could fall and get out of order. So how do you think about the organization of the letter in that regard? Once students have written their uh, third letter, then they're eligible to write their final paper. Um, what's great about the final paper is it asks them to not only discuss their process, um, but we want to have them overview everything that they've done as a potential librarian. Um, what resources did they use? What search strategies did they apply? Um, talk about that process and those resources. Did you use newspaper data, uh, newspapers, library databases, the open web, blogs, um, video screenshots, right? Did you download PDFs that are for forms that someone asked for? Did you go to government information and resources? So think about that as your practice. But then also, very important, supply a reflection on how the project includes a critical consideration. So how does reference services, um, how, does, how does this work implicate access in terms of people who are in or outside of the prison system? How, is, how can we be critical of our roles as librarians? And what does this structural volunteer program um, say about the prison industrial complex? I have the students cite authors from the syllabi, but I also want them to speak from the first person and really have this be a reflective assignment. 
there's also a component of student learning outcomes at the end that they have to supply. So I wanted to sort of um, round us out with some testimonials from students who have provided the service uh, just to hear what their final papers um, said. And these were two that I thought um, were really useful. And I asked their permission um, and I asked them to agree uh, to the quote that I used. And so this was from Sadie Rain Hope Gunn, who was a student um, in 2020. Um, she's already since uh, graduated and is now working at the New York Public Library, interestingly, in their performing arts division. And her paper um, was reflecting on a letter that requested information about Santeria. And every semester we get a letter on this. And usually the person who writes it is asking so that they can distribute it among those um, that they are incarcerated with. And so Sadie says, and I quote, to think of the enslaved Africans who brought this religion to new lands and have, have it survive, to think of the man writing to me, trying to learn more about a religion that had already been so policed and persecuted. It was incredibly heavy thinking about the strains that this information has faced in being passed down, not only as a religion, but also as an ancestral practice an inherently radical and sacred connection to the world. The only hopeful feeling was that this man was practicing and disseminating African ancestral practices from hundreds of years ago to other men around him in search of guidance and spiritual connection. The next reflective uh, quote was from Chris Jacobs just this past fall. So Chris is a current student. and. Um, he really, well, I'll just read what he had to say. Um, he was thinking about sort of the archive um, and these letters. And his letter, his reflection wrote, I have no way of knowing, of course, if these letters will actually enter the personal archives of their recipients. They may never reach them, may never be read, may be read once and discarded. I have no sense of prison policies for the keeping of personal effects and papers. Maybe they will be seized and destroyed in some petty and arbitrary exercise in punitive authority. If they do make it to their recipients, however, I find it hard to believe they would not take on some special significance, considering the environment in which they are consumed, an environment in which agency and information are so circumscribed. As stated by the ACRL frames, the format and context of an information object are part of what gives it value and meaning. Quote from ACRL, information creations are valued differently in different contexts, such as academia or the workplace. The extreme context of incarceration must have a commensurate extreme effect on this process of evaluation. So finally, I want to end with considerations for putting this work into your course. I think it's highly valuable. Um, if you want to adopt it, just know that it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time, not only when you go home to help walk through every week, the five letters that may have been distributed that week, um, but the instructional time. In every class, uh, students are going to, we're going to read these letters together and then they have to um, sort of like talk about it. It's, it's priceless. You can't, uh, have any other supplement for that kind of learning, but it does take some coordinated instructional time. Uh, when you're going to edit it, what I do is I ask people if they know that weekend they have a friend coming over or they have a big assignment, they should not uh, request a letter that weekend because they have the one week to write to do the 18 page letter. So they have to, uh, you have to think about the editing practice and time and the labor each week for yourself and for your students um, to make sure that these letters look good and they, they read well and they can be seen. And then finally, I would say uh, positionality, that not all students are gonna come to this assignment with excitement for, uh, we wrote Veronica Ariano Douglas's mutuality and reference, uh, that they are gonna learn from this just as much as the, at the requester will learn. So, so you have to get them there, right? And so that to me is where the learning happens, but that's the labor on your part as an instructor. So I think incorporating this work into the experiences of all via the readings, 
Um, that's one way to get them into it, but also just that dialogue, that participation, that conversation, those active learning strategies, that's going to get people uh, kind of in a mutual learning experience with these letters. And so that's it from me. Thank you for uh, listening. I wanted to make sure that you have um, the Pratt Syllabus Archive, the Reference Librarianship and Justice History Practice and Praxis text that does uh, have Emily Jacobson's article that discusses this project. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can always email me. I've had this email address for 10 years, shantasmithcruz at gmail.com. And I'm so happy to answer any of your questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Via Nicholas. I'm an associate professor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Rhode Island. Um, thank you so much to the San Francisco Public Library's Jail and Reentry Services for inviting me to participate in this conversation and just for their partnership over the years with our LIS program. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video and then I can start presenting. So I want to talk about um, teaching incarceration in LIS and how I go about doing that. Um, there are so many reasons why um, I incorporate talking about incarceration in LIS. It was hard to like boil it down or rein it in. So this isn't a comprehensive list, of course. Um, but Really, we need to read, talk about, and analyze incarceration in the U.S. in LIS because it touches so many points of our field. Um, some of my priorities for incorporating um, incarceration in the curriculum is, first, this idea of giving information context. Our students will be library and information professionals in a world where incarceration is normalized and invisible and highly visible in the U.S. Um, incarceration is an institution that's constantly present but not always seen in everyday life. So I want to train them to understand the context and the institutionalization of incarceration. Um, I want them to know some background information about incarceration and in LAS that's what we call uh, giving information context. So we're not just performing an information service for a particular population, but understanding the context for that um, exchange. So one example of this is that students to understand the numbers in incarceration, that nearly 2.3 million people are incarcerated in the US um, and a large population is people of color, um, Blacks and Latinx folks especially, and there's a growing population of uh, women that are incarcerated, um, that prison labor generates billions of dollars in profits, um, which government and private corporations share, and that um, the prison strikes of 2016 and 2018 attest to the low wage um, in these labor practices. So I just want our students to know that incarceration is a part of our everyday lives, whether we see it or not. Um, second, that the incarceration industry overlaps with our field in more ways than we might notice. Um, Dr. Jeannie Austin calls this large population of incarcerated and former, formerly incarcerated populations as this unseen, invisible public. So if we're talking about a library space, it, a public library or academic library, it's like, who's not there at that time who's missing and this is a large chunk of the public population. Um, Dr. Austin says scholars and activists have established that the structuring power of white supremacy shapes the landscape of the prison and perceptions of who constitutes the public, especially as people in jail and prison are removed from association with the publics and public spaces. And um, also Prison labor is often used in university infrastructures, maybe even libraries as well. So the University of Rhode Island, my workplace uses furniture assembled um, in the Department of Corrections. My own department has refused to purchase this. So we um, use like 1970s office furniture 
or I used a lot of stuff that I found on the sidewalk or eventually just bought my own or bought mine with my professional funds. We tend to buy our furniture with our professional funds now. Um, that's not like to boycott that prisoners are building quality furniture, but it's more the concern about low wages paid in prisons and that prison becomes um, an industry that makes money. So you want more people in incarcerated to work at lower wages. So that's our concern. Um, and then in and uh, if you want to see, um, you can go to correctionalindustries.doc.ri.gov backslash shops backslash furniture. I'll, I have that in my um, notes as well to see um, basically this whole state of Rhode Island um, purchases the incarceration furniture. Um, finally, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, and community members um, are intimate um, with the, of this part of this pipeline. Pipeline are also intimate within the library, so it's not just like our patrons are incarcerated, but students have incarcerated loved ones. Um, you know, patrons in libraries that are in the public or in academic libraries probably have incarcerated loved ones. Um, I had incarcerated family members and incarcerated loved ones. So it's like just making visible that those people are intimately in, in our lives. So in this presentation, I wanna identify a variety of approaches um, for incorporating information and incarceration into coursework, identify pedagogical tools for student reflection, and increase awareness of pressing issues on incarceration in the library. Um, my coursework in general focuses on reference and information behavior, and I also manage a track called Information Equity, Diverse Communities, and Critical Librarianship. Within this track, I or and in general, I teach searching for answers, meeting users' information needs, social justice and youth literature, critical disability approaches to LIS, the history of libraries, and multiculturalism in libraries. So really, incarceration can be taught in any of these courses through many interests. So I'll just touch on a few. Um, in Searching for Answers, I'll cover a little bit more about how we've collaborated with Reference by Mail with the San Francisco Public Library. But um, I noticed that Dr. Austin's work really hits home in searching for answers and in other classes because they point out um, that incarcerated people are this invisible public. Um, in social justice and youth literature and searching for answers, our introduction to reference class, the article in, by Dr. Austin entitled Critical Issues in Juvenile Detention Center Libraries um, it really hits home for students. I noticed that it kind of turns on a light bulb for some or gives language of experiences for others. Um, so that helps students sort of see how um, incarceration, how librarianship is done with incarceration and at the youth le level. Um, in social justice and youth literature, um, we also talk about incarceration through young adult books. So uh, the LAS student deciding how they're going to choose in their collection books about incarceration. Um, we want to know how to choose culturally competent books. So these are some examples um, of books that they might choose. And we really do that by making sure we're looking through helpful book lists. So these examples came from socialjusticebooks.org. Um, those book lists prioritize like authenticity, um, that there are a lot of people of color that are authors, um, and that the books are varied. So that the main character is um, not, it's not just about incarceration, but the main character might have very nuanced experience through um that storyline. Um, so some example, some of the examples of children's literature is Visiting Day by Jacqueline Woodson, Mama's Nightingale by Edwidge Danticat, um, youth, young adult literature, they can read From the Desk of Zoe Washington by Janae Marks, um, Santiago's Road Home by Alexandra Diaz, 
And really what I want students to do is identify like, how are they gonna find um, solid books for their library collections and, um, and then reading the text to understand nuance. And then in my class, Multiculturalism in Libraries, um, this is an introductory course and it covers a broad range of topics. So um, we read in general about incarceration in libraries. And in this class, we read Dr. Austin's work, Restorative Justice, as a tool to address the role of policing incarceration um, in the lives of the, in, in the US, in the lives of youth in the US. Um, we also read The New Jim Crow, by Michelle Alexander, and we've just taken on the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson to really understand like race and incarceration in the U.S. Um, so those are all texts that I found students really work through. Um, and when they read Dr. Austin's work, Restorative Justice, they I, I like that because they start to identify alternatives to policing in the library. Um, they, some folks identify that how their family members have been policed in the library. So there's a lot of conversation that comes out of that. So um, I wanna explore real quick how um, we do reference by mail in LSC 504. This is searching for answers, meeting users information needs. And um, in this course, we partner with the San Francisco Public Library um, to answer letters to incarcerated patrons. So this class partners with the San Francisco Public Library to answer letters um, through their reference by mail program. Through reference by mail, students answer reference inquiries from incarcerated patrons through snail mail. The learning objectives for this assignment are to read, reflect, and analyze incarceration systems um, in the US, to research and respond to written refer reference letters with reflection on RUSA standards and SFPL training guidelines, to build group work skills in responding to reference by mail letters, and to advance perspectives of liberation and alternative formations to the carceral states. Students are given a lecture and a training uh, from SF, the SFPL librarian, and we lead with the understanding that incarceration is constructed around formation of race, class, gender, disability, sexuality, and citizenship in the US. We use critical race theory and theories of racial capitalism as a foundation for this assignment. Um, and we adapt CRT observations to LIS. So we acknowledge that racism is endemic to US life. LIS must challenge the historicism and pursue a contextual analysis of social issues. CRT is an interdisciplinary set of research practices that are still evolving um, and need to be applied to LIS in depth. And CRT um, should incorporate common experiences and shared experiences as the other that oppressed people bring to the struggle to reshape knowledge. Race is always central to the analysis of social issues and librarianship when using CRT as a framework. So for this assignment, um, students read some of The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, um, reference services to incarcerated people with um, Debbie Rabina and Emily Drabinsky, and Jeannie Austin's restorative justice as a tool to address the role of policing incarceration in the lives of youth in the United States. Um, students are given an orientation to the program overall, they're broken up into groups and they determine a group leader and various group roles and they agree upon times and deadlines and then they, this first day um, during their orientation, they sign a group contract um, on their role and responsibilities and the timing of the letters they'll be answering. They receive letters bi-weekly, and usually they do around three or four rounds of letters, so each student gets their own letters. Um, they work on responses within SFPL's guidelines and, um, and the rules, and then there's really a back and forth process, and what I noticed is that revise and resubmit process is actually really, really valuable, um, even though it can be frustrating, like, for all of us when we're doing work where we receive revisions, but the students learn so much. They're given so much 
detail from the SFPL librarian, or they might create a rubric um, of the guidelines and what they're looking for in responding to letters, and they might get feedback from their peers. And this is sort of where they work out responding um, with a really quality letter. And so they do that um, over the whole semester and they write a final reflection where um, they're reflecting on the process, on the information that they provided and the revisions, and then they're reflecting on the bigger picture of incarceration in the United States. So they're required to bring in those theories that they read on, um, on incarceration. So um, I try not to assume that incarceration is separate or out there from the classroom. Students have incarcerated family members or have been incarcerated themselves or have incarceration impact them in other ways. Um, we want to resist the missionary approach to incarceration where information is viewed as a service or um, provides this um, function that is not necessarily a critical exchange. Um, over the years, we've had students discuss how they had family and friends who were incarcerated and how this experience kind of might have changed the perspective um, or made them more like intimately understand the experience of incarceration. Um, so I use a tool every week um, called my metacognitive reflection. And um, I built this out of a book, I believe it was called Teaching and Learning for um, Impact, but I'll put it in my notes. Um, so I built it out of a, a sort of pedagogical teaching book. Um, and I wanna make space for weekly quick writes. They can handwrite it, speak it, um, draw, do a video or audio or handwritten journal entries where they respond to reflection questions without necessarily having to like cite academic work. Um, this metacognitive work is really for them to step back and think about how, how are they learning or how are they reacting to the work and what they're learning. Um, metacognitive and metacognition is to see how and what we learn from a bigger picture to get to this point in our own learning cognition, quick writes and reflections on our own thoughts and feelings are an important way of seeing our process. So that's helpful. I also tell them um, I'm not gonna like, <laughs> this This might be controversial or like can be contested, but I don't read it or listen to it because I really want them to have like a freedom just to speak or reflect um, through embodiment. And so in some way, so as long as there's something turned in there weekly, they get points. Um, and I don't want them to think I'm like judging the process necessarily. I do that a lot for the information equity tracks as they are sort of processing new information because um, I think it's helpful for them to like digest their own bigger project process of it. So right now, um, incarceration in my own work um, has come up a lot in the research I've been doing recently, and it certainly overlaps with LIS. Um, I'm focusing on my upcoming book, Data Borders, How Silicon Valley is Building an Industry Around Immigrants, and how detention, incarceration, and deportation are systems of data gathering and surveillance, and how that surveillance touches the edge of everyone's everyday lives. So um, here are like some examples of ICE contracts with different major companies, um, companies that are in the library and then com companies that we just interact with in everyday lives. Um, the LexisNexis database is one example of how Department of Homeland Security's ICE and Border Patrol are constantly networked into our data for immigration, immigrant surveillance. LexisNexis has historically been an information management tool um, and has moved into sort of big data management. Um, and they've actually been partnering with ICE for a long time, like I think a decade. Um, they partner with ICE to allow access to people's data and to gather data on undocumented people. Um, the ethical concern here is that a professional and academic within LIS 
as professionals and academics within LS, we teach these databases um, to our students who go on to teach them in the library, of course. Um, and, you know, we conduct tutorials on these databases. We retrieve information with these databases. Um, data is gathered through LexisNexis um, and it's called Lex IDs. People who have digital footprints um, have a large amount of data in LexisNexis, whether they know it or not. Um, Lex IDs are unique identifiers that Relex, their larger corporation, assigns to people like a social security number. The company has them for over two thirds of everyone in the US. Um, they probably have one for you, says Sarah Landon, who is a former librarian and is a law professor at CUNY. They are more intimate and powerful than your social security and um, they can tell the government everything about you and they're updated in real time. So um, neither Relex Group, LexisNexis or Thompson Reuters can ensure that they're providing comprehensive, complete or accurate data. Thompson Reuter, Reuters admits that your data could be mixed up with other people's data and the companies don't recommend depending on their data for any person purpose. Um, I personally did retrieve my data through LexisNexis and I got like 70 pages of personal data about myself that they had um, been gathering. Um, so it's a problem because of our own ownership of our data, um, but also that it sort of collaborates with the larger project of ICE of retrieving undocumented people's data. Um, so my book, Data Borders, puts language to this emerging data border that we all live in by way of our data. Um, I collaborate with undocumented DACA naturalized citizen and permanent residents who have experienced det detention, deportation, and incarceration in many ways. Um, the people I interview are from my hometown and they're friends of family and um, just people in my own network. So I wanted to interview people who trust me and who feel comfortable being interviewed. Um, but almost everyone I know has been in immigrant detention centers. Um, so I wanna collaborate with them to name this emerging state where we're constantly um, in this data border to name what this data border is. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about exciting aspects of my work because <laughs> um, that can be a little bit of a downer. Um, after describing and naming these emerging data borders in my book, I utilize a method called reimagining techno futures. Reimagining techno futures is a method that imagines different borders and information technologies with people from my community in Riverside County, California. Um, and this method uses imagination as a method of response to the state of data borders. Um, I approach imagining different systems as a counter to the powerful mythos of storytelling shaped by Silicon Valley and ICE and DHS. Um, so I want to promote um, undocumented people and specifically Latinx immigrant communities um, as reimagining techno futures and alternatives to borderlands. Um, this is a method that comes from black feminist thought. So Sophia Noble and Ruha Benjamin and Adrian Marie Brown have all talked about the power of imagining from underrepresented communities. Um, so one example is um, Luce. She came in 2001, right after 9-11 through the San Ysidro border, um, and she came undocumented. And so I asked her, what would you build or create or imagine if you could build anything without limits? And she said, I would use Rapunzel's paintbrush to paint anything and go through the painting. I would go to my mom's house in Mexico. So she can't go back to Mexico because she doesn't have citizenship. So she hasn't seen her mom since she migrated over here. And it's too dangerous for her to try to go back and cross back without citizenship. So this is really just imagining alternatives to the sort of heavily surveilled technologies that these folks experience. Um, one of my interview collaborators, um, Juana, had um, 
had been writing to incarcerated people. Like she's always had pen pals with incarcerated people for a long time. So um, one of her friends has sent us quite a few um, images of his artwork and we like, we put it up in our little art space in our home. Um, so as she was describing data borders to him, he sent this image that you see with the Statue of Liberty back as like how he interpreted um, the book that she was describing to him. Um, and that's really where I, like he sent it years ago. I think this is 2021. That's kind of what gave me the idea of the second part of the book of like reimagining states um, and trying to illustrate what we're imagining. Um, as Tekka, who I interviewed, said she would build a technology that could help remove the contamination of the world. Um, she said a machine with filters that would clean out the air and the trash. Um, Oscar said he would create an app that lets people start over with a fresh start, something that gives immigrants the option of not having a record and clearing their record, like for people who have been deported two or three times, um, just like people who get to change their name giving people a fresh start without that record. And then on the far right, that's the work I'm doing now. So I'm working with um, women that have come here undocumented and they have different levels of citizenship now. Um, but we're kind of going back to the basics of like, how would you imagine technology spaces? Like, what would you, how do you wanna learn technology? Like as you're engaging in technology, where, what do you want to hear or see or feel or taste? So um, if you think of like the computer room, how you would usually see a computer room that might be very closed in and a line of computers, like these women would imagine way more light and air and plants and music. And um, so just trying to go way back to like, how do we design information spaces and how would Latina immigrant communities do that? Um, so general tips for faculty in LIS, um, again, I, I found a lot of students resonate with restorative justice. I think it brings in a lot, um, of responses. A lot of students are like, when they learn about a social issue, they want to say they want a response. <laughs> um, but they, they're really challenged by this article. Um, and I think they feel like it gives them alternative responses to, incarceration and um, policing in the library. Um, from reflections and discussions, I've noticed, noticed that students find this helpful um, in thinking differently, like instead of calling the police, they are seeking out de-escalation trainings. Um, and then I recommend um, we also don't assume incarcerations out there, like our students could have incarcerated family members or have been incarcerated themselves. Um, I want to try to bring in like seeing these data borders in which we reside. That can be challenging. Like I requested my Lex ID from LexisNexis and we have a right to do that, but you have to have a driver's license or an ID an address. So there's a lot of privilege for that. Like I have to feel comfortable retrieving all the data that LexisNexis has on me um, through ITs and citizenship. So that's one way to do it, but it might um, feel invasive to some students. Electronic Frontier Foundation has this great database called Atlas um, of Surveillance, where folks can look up their hometowns and see um, what kind of surveillance technologies are being used in the, their hometown. For example, my hometown of Marietta has, which has been cited for border detention center issues and poor conditions. Um, when I look up Marietta, California in the Atlas of Surveillance, I can see that the Marietta Police Department uses ring cameras and facial recognition software. So I'm just trying to local make local to my LIS students like how resonant these surveilling technologies are that lead to incarceration and um, detention. Um, and one of my bigger challenges um, in teaching all of this 
is um, a lot of students and librarians, you know, we ask for a lot of librarian feedback in the LAS classroom. And of course we have an advisory board. So we're really connected to librarians that are currently like in their career so that we can support LAS students. Um, and a lot of students and librarians really want students to come out with skills. Um, there's a heavy emphasis on skills in LAS education. So what I found challenging over the years is making the argument that when students read theories like critical race theory or um, theories around racial capitalism, um, that is the skill. Students, we know that LAS is overwhelmingly white um, and that white students don't necessarily have a, a sort of advanced way of thinking about race. Like they weren't challenged to think about race from early on. So there might be a lot of catching up to do um, with at least white students in LAS becoming more um, sort of well-versed in knowing about race and racism in the US. So my challenge is valuing um, theory in LAS as a skill and that students really de dig deep into um, these readings um, so that when they go into the workplace as librarians, that skill will transfer over. If they see policing in the library or a certain group of people that are being surveilled in the library, um, that they're gonna think first about everything that they learned in library school and that that skill will transfer over. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you for attending this informational session. My name is Miriam Sweeney and I'm an associate professor at the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alabama. Uh, before we begin, I want to go ahead and thank SFPL's Jail and Reentry Services team for developing this training session and um, and congratulate them, of course, on their sponsorship from the Mellon Foundation for their uh, funded project, Expanding Information Access for Incarcerated People. This is such important work and it's really exciting um, also that ALA can um, support and partnership with these training sessions. So it's a pleasure to be invited to this project and also a pleasure to be along, featured alongside the other presenters for these trainings. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera so I can go ahead and start. Let's see. All right, so in today's session, I'll be talking more about how library and information science educators, so LIS for those of you uh, who might not be initiated, might create space across their curricula for information, conversations, and critical reflection about incarceration, including things like the history of mass incarceration in the United States, intersections of libraries and policing, the role of information technologies as carceral technologies, and also possibilities for abolitionist librarianship. Um, LAS is an interdisciplinary and people-centered discipline. And because of this, it has many different entry points for teaching and learning about incarceration. So my goal is to represent uh, some of these ideas for where footholds might occur in the curriculum so that, um, so that others listening may adapt and innovate in ways that fit, that, that fit your unique courses. Drawing from my own experiences teaching, I will share how I've approached integrating these topics in and across the classes I've taught, and also offer suggestions for other possible ways to highlight incarceration as a focal topic in LIS education. So this is not meant to be exhaustive um, or a prescriptive way to approach these complex topics, but I do hope this session will serve as just a starting place for considering how the topic of incarceration might be brought into many kinds of LIS educational contexts. So a little bit about me to situate the kinds of research I do and give more information about the kinds of courses I teach. So I would characterize myself as a critical digital media and information scholar who studies things like interface design, um, chatbots and digital assistants, voice interfaces, artificial intelligence and big data infrastructures using lenses of race, gender and sexuality and class as starting points 
um, to ask questions about how these things, you know, are shaped by and shape society in different ways. And I've also conducted research um, around issues related to race and whiteness and um, in sort of aspects of DEI um, and librarianship from a critical librarianship perspective. So those perspectives are shared throughout the kind of research that I conduct. So critical, uh, critical reflections, critical uh, cultural toolkits, for instance. So the classes I teach, not surprisingly, um, overlap with these areas of research and expertise. And uh, I also bring some of these, this information and perspective into other core classes as well. So core classes I teach um, are related to things about the social and cultural foundations of the profession. And I have an example on the slide of two courses. One is called Information and Communities, um, which is very much kind of an introduction to ethics and values of the profession, things like that. And then professional paths, which really is meant to give students kind of a broad glimpse at the, you know, the different avenues within LIS that might be available to them, um, especially for folks who, you know, prior to maybe starting school, you know, have either kind of a limited idea of what LIS might be, or maybe no idea at all, right? Um, we, we get all kinds there. And then with elective classes, um, I teach a course specifically focused on race, gender, and sexuality in LIS. And then also elective courses about sort of the technology sides of my interests. So things like social aspects of information and also AI and society. And so these are just some examples of the kind of courses I teach. All of the classes I teach though, starting with the core classes, actively engage with concepts of structural power and draw on readings and theories from black, indigenous, people of color, women, queer, LGBTQIA, disabled uh, people in communities, et cetera. So I encourage students to ask questions about, you know, who gains from, as well as who might be harmed by particular social arrangements, institutions, policies, and systems, and also whose voices and perspectives are missing or underrepresented in this conversation. Um, so that I try to integrate throughout all of my classes as kind of a lens or an ethos. And I try to normalize discussions from the start about white supremacy, racism, you know, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, et cetera, as LIS conversations. As in here in LIS, we talk openly and honestly about power structures and we learn the language to name these systems when we see them as a tool set. And so I find that this is particularly effective when paired closely with critical interpretations of ALA core values, such as social responsibility, diversity access, intellectual freedom, democracy, privacy, right? I guess I could name all of them here, but they are so all interwoven, aren't they? Um, but in short, the vantage point of LIS education, the lens matters and has a lot of potential to lay a foundation for deeper conversations about incarceration and LIS as a discipline um, and profession. So kind of going back to the framework of the core classes and the elective classes that I have, I wanna give folks an idea of how then to integrate these ideas across these different um, class clusters. <clears throat> In introductory course classes, LIA students are often learning about aspects of library history, you know, different types of libraries and institutional contexts for LIS work. Um, professional ethics, core values, and maybe also current events or issues in LAS and basic service models. And so, um, you know, here are some of the common topics that I cover in my core classes. So institutional context for LAS work, information needs in a diverse society, and core values discussions. Um, these are very prevalent, you know, focal thematic points. And they happen to actually be wonderful areas to weave in examples that deal with incarceration and normalize, including incarcerated people as part of the public or the communities that we often invoke in professional discourse, um, but uncritically, right? So this is an opportunity to critically and um, actively include incarceration and incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people into those conversations. Um, so discussing institutionalized context, I want to go into sort of each of those areas now and give some examples of how this might play out and along with, you know, again, a non-exhaustive set of resources that I might use while reading, having students read and talk about these things. So in discussing institutional context for LIS work, 
I also include archival work in this since you know, these things are, are um, often taught together and interrelated, but often touching on special library types such as medical law, business, academic, and public libraries. Like those are traditionally introduced. So this is a natural entry point to also discuss prison, jail, juvenile detention facility libraries as well, maybe also immigrant detention centers as well. Um, some of the readings on this slide that I have are readings that I have used um, in the past to kind of open up some of those introductory conversations that help, um, you know, ground the conversation about prison librarianship within you know, and introduce sort of a critical um, element and discussion to that. And that's, you know, a kind of a key point of that lens that I was talking about before. I find that the Fenley and Bates, uh, you know, gives a little bit of a background of the development of um, of, of prison librarianship and kind of calls out different models um, that we can then critically examine in class, you know, such as sort of the, the morality or, um, you know, punitive models and things like that. So we can name those and then together start a conversation. And of course, the Austin and L2020 2020 article um, gives a really wonderful overview of, again, you know, looking at this from a critical perspective and understanding how uh, these, uh, how incarceration is shaped by and articulated through, you know, sets of oppressive systems. So again, in a, in a starting conversation, this begins to introduce um, the, the topics that we can scaffold in, in throughout the core classes. In terms of thinking about how information needs come up in core classes, just, you know, again, kind of at an introductory level, often conversations are really ripe for this, including you know, the kind of partnerships that public libraries have with, um, with jails and prisons, um, in, in terms of, you know, there are different models for, in, you know, introducing students to the idea that there are different models for this, including sort of outreach, integrative uh, models as well, um, reentry programs for formerly incarcerated people, programming and resources for children or family members who have incarcerated loved ones, or maybe, again, um, have other kinds of intimate experiences with incarceration. Um, so, you know, there's, there's numerous resources to share with students and point them to, again, as an introductory level, adding that into the conversation. So, of course, including the jail and reentry services from SFPL um, and also the NYPL jail and prison services links to their extensive programming and outreach efforts. Um, and then also um, other resources include, you know, lists of readings that um, offer you know, intersectional and justice oriented um, resources for children and families affected by incarceration. I have one listed from a reading list from the Hennepin County Library, but there are many others that, um, you know, have kind of that critical perspective informing them that we want. And then, of course, um, of this reading here by Ring Rose, et cetera, the libraries and reentry, talking about uh, library reentry programs. For students who are just coming to the profession, these are topics that. I think don't often get the shine that other kinds of information need context get, but are very easily integrated into that as kind of the, you know, the normal conversation that we have about information needs and a population that, um, that you know, deserves focal point as well. And then lastly, core values conversations are always extremely ripe for integrating conversations about um, the context of incarceration and how our core values need to be interpreted, you know, in these kind of contextual um, ways and situated ways. So, you know, th though we have a lot of conversations about intellectual freedom, um, in conversations with my students, I've, I've noted that those conversations don't always come with, you know, um, kind of the natural conversation of like, well, what does it mean for prisoners' right to read? And, you know, the ways that um, freedom is constricted in particular contexts. Um, so that should be definitely always part of that conversation that um, the intellectual freedom has like so many overlaps here to think about conditions of access and, um, you know, and specific, you know, kinds of interventions into access. I included the JSTOR access and prison link, um, which is, you know, intervention to making JSTOR material um, available in prisons, right? Like there's all these interesting sort of access conversations that we could be having um, integrated into the overall conversations about the core value of access. Privacy and confidentiality, social responsibility, all of things, things go with this, you know, hand in hand as well. I have a link to, you know, the PEN America site, which is a nonprofit focused on intellectual freedom. And they have, you know, some wonderful reports about like, you know, the cost of reading in prisons in terms of censorship and e-reader tablets, you know, kind of 
um, integrating conversations about uh, format and context and you know other things about access and um, you know and, and publishers and gatekeeping, right? So the kinds of things that we are already talking about with core values have these natural extensions over into um, an area that really you know where incarceration really has a lot to offer and challenge um, and extend ideas about how these core values are situated, contextualized, and like applied, right, in specific ways. Okay, great. So um, those are, you know, thinking about kind of just beginning discussions to introduce concepts and normalize them in the field. In elective classes and advanced classes, you have opportunities to kind of go deeper in different areas and, you know, spend more time with in-depth conversations. So in my elective classes, I tend to reemphasize these same concepts by giving that in-depth treatment on topics, you know, such as the race, gender, and sexuality class, for instance, or by application to how information technology and AI are designed, used, and interpreted in society. I mean, that's an interest of mine, so that can factor in very easily to those classes as well. But all of these courses focus on issues of structural inequality, bias in systems, um, and the institutional and technological histories that are rooted in systems of power and domination, such as colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, et cetera. Okay, so kind of taking the same approach, um, the topics that I am going to focus on specifically kind of offering some uh, entry point into are the in-depth exploration of structural inequality within the U.S. is one topic that um, I highlight. Policing and, and libraries is another topic. Information technologies as carceral technologies. And then lastly, alternatives, resistance, and abolitionist strategies um, all can show up here. So taking those one by one. Um, in looking at structural inequality in the US, this conversation has to be present and scaffolded so that there it, the rest of it makes sense, right? Like, we can't have conversations about um, incarceration in the field if we don't understand how incarceration is located in this environment, you know, as you know, part of this larger sort of apparatus of um, policing and oppression and um, uh, and colonialism and racial supremacy, right? So primers on racial inequality and white supremacy are very important to give students the tools for this. Um, students are entering these conversations from different points, some with sort of intimate uh, knowledge of how these systems, you know, shape um, life opportunities, and others are operating maybe from the position of never having thought about that, a position of privilege, right? So it's really important, I think, to, you know, get this outlined. Um, like other speakers um, who have talked today, you might see similar resources here. Um, Dr. Via Nicholas actually gave me the wonderful tip of uh, integrating CAST, the origins of our discontents in our classes. And I tried that for the first time this year. And it was a really great addition to the race and gender class. Students loved it. And she touches on so many things about racial inequality um, and inequality just sort of generally, but, but definitely also draws um, the linkages between, you know, from slavery to policing to and, uh, and mass incarceration as well. Of course, the new Jim Crow is another wonderful resource from Ruha Benjamin as well. Or the new Jim Code is a wonderful resource from Ruha Benjamin as well. And the new Jim Code, um, as Jim Crow as well. Sorry, let me get those two mixed up. Um, and then I had students watch the 13th documentary by Ava DuVernay and the race and gender class to get that longer, um, you know, history that, again, is um, very much detailed in the new Jim Crow but hearing it and seeing the footage and understanding it in that in the documentary way, I find to engender really powerful conversations with students um, to help introduce them to the more detailed and longer trajectory of the history of mass incarceration and policing. And then kind of talking about how the ideologies of like deficit based models and things still show up today. Um, the Yasso article, Whose Culture Has Capital, is kind of a classic one. Um, but can then be paired with, you know, authors like Austin and Via Nicholas, who are looking at ideas of the deficit model in how the, the, the profession has approached services to the incarcerated. So there's a lot of wonderful sort of overlaps here and um, kind of a, a deeper grounding of the way that incarceration, um, you know, becomes a, a mode of inequality. Policing in and libraries. 
Um, so in this way, I like to call attention to actively considering how libraries uphold carceral logics and policies they have, the practices that we, you know, kind of take for granted and or normalize and uh, the profession and then also relationships with the policing apparatus in different ways. Um, I really enjoyed the Fry and Austin article I've highlighted here, whose safety is the priority, you know, asking these questions about, you know, positionality and thinking about, again, you know, for whom do these services serve and, you know, who is um, sort of already assumed to be at the margin or the threat, you know, in these, in these models. Um, no holds barred policing and security in the public library is also a thoughtful piece, as is Moreno, belong beyond the police libraries as locations of carceral care. Um, they both touch on, um, you know, a lot of different topics. The Robinson piece really is asking questions about the normalization of security and policing as an apparatus that becomes part of the library staff and the library landscape. Um, you know, thinking about aspects of de-escalation, aspects of, you know, other ways of um, accountability and justice. The Moreno article um, is wonderful for opening up that question beyond sort of having like literal police in the library, but also just thinking about things like fines and, you know, how, um, you know, having fines is part of kind of a carceral logic of, you know, that punishes and is punitive and kind of based on the same sorts of moral assumptions that we see um, part and parcel with incarceration and, and policing as well. So all of these open up a lot of sort of thoughtful conversation about what it means to really look at our own institutions and understand ourselves not as, again, separate from, but part of these apparatuses. And then lastly, um, information and carceral technologies. It's very important, I think, to introduce ideas about how surveillance and also surveillance. Surveillance is when we, you know, surveillance is kind of a top-down way of um, of looking and knowing. Surveillance is, you know, kind of more peer-to-peer, -peer, the way that we maybe kind of surveil each other and um, police each other, right? And so some of the examples of that would be through um, discussions of facial recognition technology, Amazon Ring, border technologies, right? These kinds of technologies that we see all around us and that students might be familiar with personally, but then also professionally increasingly um, as well. And kind of understanding that the surveillance apparatus is connected to the policing apparatus, right? It's connected to um, the carceral system in these different ways. Um, so, you know, reading about um, reading about that, right? I have this article here, the, Fres the Frescella Amazon Ringmaster, the surveillance circulus, that really gives kind of a nice overview of the way that um, you know, the Amazon ring is actually integrated into policing structures. Um, and then also conversations about, you know, algorithmic bias, predictive criminal sentencing models and big data in policing, um, helping students and educating them to understand that um, bias in machines, you know, actually comes down to, um, you know, models of, of harm and creating differential life opportunities and also tracking people into carceral systems and, and, car and tracking people into um, and into prisons, right, specifically. Um, so within those conversations, we have, you know, we have some articles about um, the way that predictive policing models work. We, t we pull up, you know, the different um, sort of uh, the models that are used by courts and see how like different uh, things are kind of weighted and talk about that and the assumptions that are built into those. Um, we also look at, you know, sort of the border as another place where this is happening. Shannon Matron's piece, All Eyes on the Border, um, has a wonderful discussion of information technologies, you know, being used again to um, section off uh, people into sort of acceptable versus not acceptable um, citizens or participants in society through the carceral system as well. So all of these are different, you know, entry points into the into thinking about how information technologies structure um, and you know and move people around um, through these systems as well. And this, of course, is like a much larger topic that I could fit on the slide, but it just gives you an idea of the kinds of things you might talk about here as you're talking about. Um, technology and and you know sort of uh, basic technology literacies. Okay, and then um, lastly, resistance was the last category I had. 
Um, and this is again, kind of all non-comprehensive <laughs> as I'm talking about this, I realize there are so many more things we could add in here, but I do think that it's important to, um, as we're critically analyzing these spaces and understanding um, incarceration, you know, through this critical lens, that part of that is about understanding like what we would want instead, right? So I do think that it's important to introduce students the idea that there might be abolitionist strategies to employ um, and give lens to a new way of thinking about the work that is being done in LIS and institutions. I like to introduce students to the Abolitionist Library Association where they might find you know, other like-minded professionals who would like to share ideas and network and talk about that. Um, the restorative justice as a tool to address the role of policing and incarceration is a wonderful example that opens up conversations along with other readings about restorative justice and what it means to really like rethink relationships that we have with each other and communities uh, in the library um, in sort of a hands-on way, right? Assumptions about, about process, about procedure, about policing um, that really have become built into the way um, professional practice happens and you know what does it mean to resist and rethink and restructure those things. Um, I would like to introduce also uh, aspects of data justice that go along with the information technology things from the last slide and think about, you know, what does it mean to um, push back on sort of the big data apparatus that also is part of carceral institutions. Um, I love the feminist data manifest no from C4 et al, a wonderful group of scholars who came together and put together um, you know, this wonderful manifest no about, you know, sort of pushing back. But offering that refusal has a long intellectual history as well. And doing other readings about that um, as a way to sort of to point out that like there are other ways to do things. There are other, uh, there are, and, and it's our responsibility to act, right? That um, I think sometimes students can feel rather impotent in these conversations, but I find that conversations about resistance and about imagining futures, right? As, as Melissa V. Nicholas does in her book, Data Borders, generates conversations to help students feel like, um, you know, cognitively unstuck around that. And that um, there's something to fight for, you know, this is, there's an action there and a call to action. I think that's a very important part of this conversation. Okay, and so just to bring us home here, some questions um, I was asked to think about for this training. One was what challenges do you face in terms of teaching about incarceration in LIS educational settings? And I would say one of the largest challenges is simply that students are coming to you with so from so many different places, right? So many different kinds of lived experience. Um, they're bringing different life experiences and expectations to the conversations. For instance, some folks have never talked about incarceration before and may not have experienced it intimately, while others have direct lived experiences with the subject matter. Um, and that's hard. I mean, as an instructor, it's always hard to meet the needs of students who are all, you know, at different places. I do think, though, that um, discussion models are very helpful for that with the right ground rules. Um, so it's a sense that we're reading and discussing together and sort of this is not a uh, this doesn't have to be a deficit. This can be a place where the learning happens. Right. That that questions can get asked and um, and answered in a peer share kind of way and also um, you know, through critical reflection and engagement with the readings and through guided facilitation. So um, this is a challenge, but it is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and then the other thing is that many students are, not, are only familiar with dominant narratives about incarceration, policing and law that stem from carceral logic. Meaning, you know, I often have students who will enter the conversation with assumptions that, well, you know, if you're, but if, so if, if you're incarcerated, it means, you know, you committed a crime and have to do the time and like, you know, you did something bad. And so, you know, reprogramming that to ask different questions and situate incarceration um, in ways that disrupt dominant narratives, it is something that takes time. It's not a one shot thing. This is where I think that the scaffolding these conversations and normalizing them across the curriculum has a lot of power for that, that we can introduce in many classes these ideas and conversations so that that knowledge can scaffold and the critical reflection can build. Um, it's wonderful to be able to have a class where students can go in depth on this topic, but even if they can't, 
or, you know, we want to reach students who aren't in that class, or we want to reach students or, or give them things to think about throughout their educational experience. So I think that um, understanding that this is where some students are entering the conversation also um, kind of brings us back to the importance of the lens of how we are introducing incarceration. What information are we giving students so that they can, you know, challenge these assumptions and sort of address that um, in a way that is planned and scaffolded, you know, and supported um, throughout the rest of the learning experience. And then um, lastly, how do you make room for the possibility that students might be negatively impacted by incarceration? Um, well, I certainly uh, try to assume that they that students in the class probably are negatively impacted, right? So I try to apply strategies from trauma-informed pedagogy that can help create spaces where students have flexibility, voice, and choices for how they are going to engage in the conversation, um, leaning with empathy, you know, listening, not making assumptions about people's experiences, um, can help create space for exploring potentially traumatic topics in a way that uh, folks can get in on without already assuming, you know, where they stand. And to do that, though, you have to establish clear boundaries in the class at the start in terms of and transparency and for how class is going to run and, you know, establish trust with all participants. So that that's the work of the facilitator and the instructor in that. So my goal is always working with the class to foster an atmosphere that respects individuals need for safety and respect to, you know, include the ability to make mistakes and learn from mistakes, but also to, um, have conversations about, you know, what it means to be, you know, to be called in in a conversation, what it means to take accountability for our own words, our own feelings, our own energy that we're bringing to the conversation, um, to engage in critically reflective and listening practices, right? Active listening, um, practicing communication tools um, in different ways. We can't assume that students have those skills coming to the classroom either, um, so I think, you know, as we're, um, again, it becomes an opportunity to, to lead by doing, right? Practicing kind of trauma-informed approaches helps them practice those same approaches that might be also useful to taking into their library of practice or professional space of practice um, and working, you know, again, with, um, with communities who may have experienced racial trauma or incarceration or other, you know, other forms of um, of trauma in their lives. So, you know, it, be, it becomes a, a tool that we both employ and learn um, together. Okay, so um, my final thought is just that actively scaffolding learning about incarceration is critical for preparing LIS professionals to better meet informational needs of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And also for creating safe, welcoming spaces in our libraries and in society, that actively reject carceral logics in favor of community building, empathy, and social justice. Thank you so much. Please feel free to reach out if you wanna be in touch or continue this conversation. Thanks.